Okay, so uh, next up is uh, Dirk Jan Epping. Um, he is a, a Dutch writer, publicist, a former member of the European Parliament. He now uh, works in um, New York as a senior fellow of the London's Policy Center, a think tank, where he specializes in European affairs, Russia, and also in economic, monetary, trade, and energy policies. Um, he has also been a secretary of the cabinet of uh, Commissioner Fritz Bolkestein and Sim Kallas. Um, and hopefully, uh, Bolkestein will join us. Uh, well, later this morning. <laughs> well, thank you uh, for your introduction. And uh, I'm not, I'm not yet suffering of a jet lag, so that's why I wanted to start right away. Um, the ladies and gentlemen, welcome here. What we see in the European Union now is that there is an ever-increasing difference between the theory of European Union and its daily practice. The treaties contain a, le a legal logic that binds its provisions into a common framework and there are stated policy goals, operational means and there are legal procedures. From the outset European integration has been the product of legal experts. Its narrative sounds well like a fairy tale of good intentions. Who could possibly oppose <coughs> the way the European Union works and even won the Nobel Peace Prize? Only the utterly mean and dispirited would express this missive remarks. But then there is reality imposing itself. <coughs> in spite of well-meaning objectives, the European Union today is in bad shape. The European economy, in particular the Eurozone, is facing, according to the President of the European Central Bank, Mr. Mario Draghi, a long period of long growth and high unemployment. Unsurprisingly, the current economic situation in Europe is anathema to the philosophy of the unique European social model. In Mediterranean Europe, an entire young generation is deprived of its future. Young people eager to build their lives cannot find employment. They lack means to own a house and raise a family. Europe does not deliver on the expectations it has raised. In this part of Europe, the elderly fear their, ex their pensions will shrink, their savings will be undermined by low interest rates, if not reduced by negative rates. Both wonder whether they will be able to weather the storms on the horizon. The dilemma of Euro European integration is that the reality of daily life undermines the legitimacy of the European Union. And here we are, are at the heart of the matter. Understandably, people get angry and frustrated expressing their feelings at the ballot box. As a result, political landscapes rapidly change throughout Europe. For government parties, like the VVD, there is little time to implement reform-minded policies because any election could be your last. An increasing number of people regard Brussels as a danger. The turnout percentage at the European elections has been dropping for 35 years. Only a minority votes and a growing minority within that minority votes, votes against. And it's very easy to enrage people in public opinion and lead them to revolt, as we have seen at the, last, at the latest uh, European summit, where the UK and the Netherlands were uh, surprised with a bill of 2 billion euro, and for the Dutch government I think it was about 642 million. Now, how did this happen? I'll just give you an, 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 an educated guess what happened here. Well, if you look at the European Commission now, it is in the process of transition. The old, the, uh, there are the outgoing commissioners, they are looking for a job. There are the incoming commissioners, they're looking for their office uh, and the corridors. There are members of cabinets who are looking for a job. Um, and there are directors generals who change within the system of activity-based management. I always wonder in the Commission what inactivity-based management could be, but in that case probably just remain seated. And in that world, suddenly the statistical community comes up with a couple of figures and they, they pop up and everybody is surprised. Actually, nobody knows what was going on. Not even Mr. Barroso did know that these figures would come up and uh, Prime Minister Cameron and Prime Minister Rutte only were facing these figures at the summit. 
and of course their public opinion is enraged after what happened and it only feeds Euroscepticism. That's the only result of all this. So in this situation it's very easy to, um, to, uh, to set public opinion into revolt. The first question that comes to mind is then what went wrong? In my view, the European institutional machinery ignored the proper application of the treaties and consistently followed the orthodoxy of the ever closer union. We have seen that the, the, the legislative body of the EU has become vast, extended and basically covering nearly all policy areas. It started from a, a confined set of policies, now it's nearly covering everything. And the ambition to regulate everything under the sun has dominated policy making in Brussels for a very long time. And by doing so, the treaty has been compromised and all distinct, different competences, whether exclusive, shared or supporting, have been morphed into one single legal base. If there is a European aspect, the European Union is mandated to legislate. Instead of adhering to the provisions of the treaty, observing self-restraint and separation of powers, the institution resorted to a process of self-mandating by interpreting the morphed legal base as the political imperative to act, making scopes wide and details rich. In a good example is the Working Hours Directive of which the principles were adopted in 1993. Instead of adhering to the Treaty Provision on Social Policy, which would have provided a recommendation and its legal instrument, the Commission adopted, opted for what is now Article 288, a directive. And why? Because according to the Commission and the European Parliament, there was a political imperative uh, to create a social Europe. Legally binding detailed legislation was bound to trump softer procedures, like a recommendation. The EU persistently opted for the most far-reaching form of European legislation. And as a consequence, a directive became very prescriptive, and case law of the European Court of Justice made it even worse. Resting is also defined as working time, and even sleeping in the facility at the working place is part of working time. So basically, whether you sleep or not, you're always working. And the philosophy of the ever closer union became the driving force of its own. It is hard on detail, but short on its economic consequences. Uh, the Employment Committee of the European Parliament, and sometimes by critics nicknamed the Unemployment Committee, welcomed the directive as a symbol of civilization. But it ignored, as often does, economic realities. France believed that, that reducing working hours would inevitably lead to more work. It introduced a 35 hours working week in 1995, coming to full effect 10 years later. French competitiveness has collapsed ever since. Currently, Dutch exportations exceed the French. Unemployment is high, as is the French budget deficit and the percentages of national debt. The French are now living the French dream, which I do not know who of you speaks French, which is not a current language anymore in Holland, unfortunately. Uh, the French dream is called le beurre et l'argent du beurre. So you want to have the butter and the money of the butter. In English it would be to have the cake and eat it. In future, French butter will have to be paid by either Germany or the European Central Bank, the ECB, by printing more money. Only a European transfer union will be destined to butter up the French dream. Now, contrary to the theory of conferred competences, for which European institutions act within and according to powers derived from the treaties, the legal base has been morphed to this uh, political imperative to act. This is the most important point. Obviously, all, regardless the nature of these specific competen competences, either exclusive, shared or supporting, the various legal bases of these competences have evaporated. And as a result, there is no legal Ordnungspolitik a very important word. No Ordnungspolitik left and there is no hierarchy of norms. Uh, as was stated before by the previous speaker, there is a non-hierarchical relationship which is possible in a limited European community but which is very hard to maintain in an extensive European Union. 
The European institutional machinery starts gearing up the moment Europe, the word Europe is invoked, no matter what's, whether it con uh, con concerns the single market, financial regulation, social policy, cultural policy, sports or env env environmental policies. The legislative machinery, in particular the European Commission, the European Parliament, opt for the most detailed prescriptive form of legislation, like for example the Habitat Directive. And finally, there is no legal wriggle room to return powers from the EU common legislative body. The, com <coughs> the Commission and the Parliament would regard this, if you invoke the word return of powers, they regard this as a step backwards, because the, the legal body of the, e of the EU should only grow, there should be more added to it. And returning powers is a step backwards from the process of the ever closer union. It would be tantamount to a sort of political capitulation. It is no wonder that the EU has grown top-heavy this way. Its ambitions have far exceeded its means. Its promises, promises remain unfulfilled. Its image has been dented. Its legitimacy in, within public opinion in many countries is in peril. And worse of all, the EU brought it all upon itself. We cannot blame Americans, Russians, we cannot blame Russians for many things but not for this, uh, Chinese equally or anybody else. We allowed the process to spin out of control and the EU wanted to achieve too many goals at the same time. Lacking any sense of priority, in my view, it became too soft on the real issues and too hard on the soft issues. It believed that big government in Europe would produce big results for Europe, but unfortunately now the opposite happens. Now the question is, and that's why we are here, uh, how could the liberal family in Europe shed some light on this conundrum? Liberals are most familiar with concepts like self-restraint of public authorities, the need for small government, balance of power to prevent abuse, a policy of competition and a level playing field, and the virtue of small government. I have always been <coughs> a strong supporter of political cooperation and economic integration in Europe. Uh, there is no alternative to it, so don't misunderstand me. Um, but the current situation is not sat satisfactory at all. In fact, it even might well ignite the danger of a European cooperation unravelling. The European continent is confronted with economic stagnation at home, while its surrounding surroundings are struck by violent conflicts. Now what is the way out? No, it's, it's only, it's, although I'm a specialist in Russia, I have to say it's only water, it's not vodka. So. <coughs> what is the way out? First of all, I think we have to reintroduce the principles of the separation of power and a hierarchy of norms in this vast legislative body that we now have and within the European decision-making process. Now, what are the principles? Principle number one is the member states. The source of European cooperation and integration are the member states. That's where the legitimacy starts. It is not European institutions in Brussels, Luxembourg or Strasbourg. As Henri Henri Gaillot, member of the French Parliament, rightly stated, Europe is France, Italy, Germany, Spain, Belgium. He didn't mention Holland, but I will also include then the Netherlands. Um, that is the basis and that is the legitimacy of European cooperation and integration. The European Commission, the European Parliament, the European Court of Justice are merely institutions serving the member states and the peoples of Europe. The EU, in his view, has buried historical, geographical, cultural and demographic realities under rules, bureaucracies and procedures. But, as he said, reality always takes revenge when ignored. So first of all, the first principle for the separation of powers is to recognize member states as the source of legitimacy. That's number one. Number two, what does Europe need? It needs focus because we have this vast body of legislation and a huge treaty um, with the instruments of the decision-making process, but what does it need? It needs focus. 
The European institutions need focus and should primarily serve the peoples of Europe and their nation states in the areas of pooled sovereignty. Just recent, just a few moments ago, the word sovereignty was invoked. If the European Union is bound to be focused, it is focused on the areas of pooled sovereignty, where member states have decided to share sovereignty and cooperate in certain fields, uh, and to a very high degree. Like, for example, let me mention uh, the areas like the common market or the single market, the monetary union in countries of the Eurozone, international trade, it is the Commission negotiating, and the Commission is mandated to negotiate. Competition policy, which is basically the monopoly of the European Commission, just ask Mrs. Cruz. Environmental policies, uh, necessary to, uh, to cope with uh, cross-border uh, issues, and foreign policy to the extent possible. I don't, don't think there will ever be one unitary European foreign policy because there's only a foreign policy when the major countries um, agree, and that is France, Germany, and the United Kingdom. Uh, and the European and, and the other field, the Euro monetary union, yes, in the monetary union will not succeed if there is not a fiscal union requiring strict compliance uh, with principles of budgetary discipline. And here the European Union has been too lenient, too lenient both in the past and now again, while at the same time being very strict and vigor, vigorous regarding minor pieces of legislation. So if you, if you want to take a step back from the working hours directive, the Commission will jump in your neck, whereas on the other hand, if you try to uh, obfuscate uh, budgetary discipline, then there is always coming in a commissioner uh, to make you happy. So it is the other way around. Uh, and the EU, as it is, is this, has become therefore too unwieldy. So the need of focus. Thirdly, the principle of the return of powers. Currently, it is a one-way street because of the ever closer union orthodoxy. A return of competences to nation states is needed because the process of morphing the various legal bases into <coughs> one single political imperative to act has derailed EU legislation. It produced overregulation of a prescriptive nature. A repetition of competences is the only way to undo the detrimental impact of the morphing process. Repartition should therefore provide for the returns of competences like in the field of social policy, cultural policy, or even parts of environmental policy being too prescriptive. If cross-border issues arise, the, issue, the European uh, Union should produce a recommendation highlighting best practices. I think at the same time we should look, look at the budget. Uh, we also need a fresh look at certain funds that accompany the imperative to act like, for example, the Globalization Fund, of which the European Court of Auditors concluded that only 25% of the money available has been properly spent. The fourth principle of separation of powers is, in my view, the national parliaments. An increased role of national parliaments as guardians of subsidiarity is much needed. The European Commission, the European Parliament and the European Court of Justice are unable to act as guardians of subsidiarity because they all propose, amend and rule in the spirit of the ever closer union, because they put their own institutions at heart of the European cooperation. This has been the very reason why the principle of subsidiarity has been ignored, because it stood in the way of the political imperatives. Only national parliaments have the political legitimacy versus their public opinions to issue proper judgment on the question of which policy areas have to be dealt with at home and which, of the which on the European level. National parliaments should be the masters of subsidiarity, not the EU institutions. Principle number five, and these <coughs> concern workable arrangements. Again, the legislative body being vast, extensive, hard to cope with, needs more workable arrangements. So next to the vertical repetition of competences I have just mentioned, there is a need for horizontal flexibility regarding the policy domains and the degrees in which member states participate. 
From the perspective of the ever closer union, the EU evolves into a monolithic block. The common currency has been designed to be its driving force, but it has, has, has failed so far. The Eurozone has not evolved into a social and economic melting pot, but instead into a pressure cooker producing internal strife. As the number of member states grows, the EU should apply more flexibility. Some countries joined the Euro, others didn't. Some countries are part of Schengen, others are not. Even some non-EU countries are part of Schengen, while some EU countries are not, like the UK. In foreign affairs, some countries join a coalition of the willing, others, like mostly Germany, refrain from it. The larger the EU, the more flexibility is required to keep it working. Enhanced cooperation is one of the methods, opt-out is another. The more the EU presses for a monolithic bloc, the more political and economic tensions will build up within. Now then I would come to the next point, is, and that is to redesign the treaties. How to redesign European treaties in the light of these principles? I think, we will not be, uh, I think it will not be possible without an intergovernmental uh, conference because certain treaty provisions will have to be reviewed. Any other platform on whatever voluntary basis would lack the political clout to bring about treaty change. Obviously, some elements deserving modification can be repaired within the context of the treaties, but that exercise would be too marginal it would not allow addressing adequately the structural changes needed. So what, uh, what we need is a hierarchy of norms and a catalogue of competences. Now how to operationalize this? And here principle number one, I think we should have core competences. We should point to core competences, a catalogue of competences, should clearly define the core competences of the EU, like the single market, the euro system, international trade, common agricultural policy, fishery policy, competition, or env environmental policies. <coughs> in these domains Euro of, of pooled sovereignty, in these domains, European institutions play their full role. There, they are masters of the game. In case of stalemates, and they're also the enforcers of the system. They should inspect, they should control, and they should enforce. Uh, for example, with regard to budgetary <coughs> discipline. So in case of a stalemate within this sphere of core competences um, uh, or a deadlock, the European Council would act as a final arbiter. Secondly, the second category would be a category of secondary competences, now mostly shared and supporting competences. Uh, and they are in principle within the domain of the member states. The European Commission has supportive powers to look into cross-border aspects and offer advice by issuing recommendations. Only the European, and that would be important, <coughs> the set of core competences is not, is not locked. Because only the European Council uh, would have the power to lift secondary competences to the level of core competences uh, and by doing so, amend the catalogue of competences. For example, adding security of energy supply. So that will be, will be up to the uh, European Council, which as the manifestation of member states, is also one of the carriers of legitimacy. And thirdly, the national parliaments. What role could they play? And in case the European Commission proposes legislation on the secondary tasks, currently the shared and supporting competences, it would have to seek the consent of two-thirds of the national parliaments of the member states acting as guardians of subsidiarity. The existing system of cards enables national parliaments to stop the Commission from legislating, but only in a very short time frame. Mostly most parliaments are too late. Once they find out, the, the time the deadline has passed. So the approval-seeking mechanism should be turned around. It is the Commission that has to seek the uh, consent of national parliaments uh, and by doing so assuring that it gets a sufficient number of green cards. It should be a green light system. Uh, I hope you're not colorblind because otherwise you will get lost in this system but the word green card would be better than yellow cards or orange cards. <coughs> and um, the fourth principle would be I think the European budget, an EU budget for seven years in that time frame, should be simply limited to 1% of, of European GDP. 
uh, when that principle has been agreed to, I think there should be not too much discussion about the level of the EU budget. Um, uh, on the fifth place, flexibility. The treaty allows for a certain degree of flexibility. I already mentioned enhanced cooperation, but here we have to be, uh, we, have, we need a closer inspection because the principle of enhanced cooperation is a concept that fits the ideology of the ever closer union too because non-participating member states are support to join the cooperation at a later stage for example candidate members of the eurozone are, suppo are supposed to join the eurozone at a certain stage as the eu grows there will be more need for s uh, for safety vaults for example regarding immigration asylum distortion on the labor market or whatever um, Another principle should also be the single market should be, should be regarded as the driving force. Enhanced development of the free mo movement of services would produce a huge potential for economic growth. A single market based on mutual recognition, which will be talked about later, is the basis for economic integration, not necessarily the single currency as it has been designed now. A single market based on mutually accepted minimum quality requirements opens, for example, a vast area of activity because it is able to absorb diversity. I think the Euro system finally requires also more flexibility. How now the Euro system acts as a straitjacket tying countries in with entirely different economic backgrounds. There should be a possibility to leave the Eurozone either for some time or forever. Now what are the prospects for this reform? Generally, politicians know fairly well how to jump from A to Z, but are unable to get from A to B. So, in other words, it is easy to get from reality to the illusion, but uh, it's very hard to get to the next step. So obviously, most pressure to reform the EU comes from Great Britain, generally radiating cold feelings whenever the word European Union is mentioned. And Cameron has promised an in, of in and out, in or out referendum, before the end of 2017, if re-elected re next year. Now, there are basically several documents I have been reading with regard to the redivision of competences. First of all, there is an inventory of the Foreign Office. Um, it looks like it has been written and produced by Sir Humphrey. It's an inventory. Everything is important. And... Um, there is, uh, well, a gener a general, generally a Eurosceptic Tory would say that, uh, that the, um, the author of that document is wetter than wet. A second document is written probably by more, more Eurosceptic members of Parliament, like its president, Chris Heaton Harris, is the Fresh Start Group. My problem with the document of the Fresh Start Group is that it is too British. You cannot uh, use it or make it op operational on the European continent. It is basically a document that fits Britain in which the British, uh, well, the Conservative Party indicates where it wants to op opt out, uh, what it does not want to have, um, and therefore it cannot work as an instrument of change on the European continent. Thirdly, there is a document of the Dutch government indicating 54 example or examples of EU legislation that could return to the member states. So I think it's a very useful document. It's even possible to bring this about without treaty change. Uh, and it has invoked a debate, it has produced a debate uh, in several member states about the use of the return of powers within the framework of the treaty. But the examples uh, that are given are compelling and convincing. So I think when the former minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Timmermans, is now at the top of the European Commission. The first thing he, sh he should do is to carry out the plan he has presented here in Parliament. But I am sure that there will be not a quick fix. Uh, it is very important that we go about this uh, procedure uh, with caution. And let me conclude by saying that a quick fix will not do. It will bring some relief here and there but all deeply rooted problems will re-emerge, igniting a process of unravelling. I think a comprehensive review of the EU structures is needed through an intergovernmental conference by introducing a hierarchy of norms, include national parliaments, focus the EU on its core tasks 
and make Europe fit for the future. Thank you very much. Uh, we will have a debate now on the uh, speech by Derek Jan Epping. Um, and I already saw one finger before the coffee break, and that was from Arnoud Meis, so I give him the floor first. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your presentation and your thought provoking, to say the least, uh, uh, speech. Um, and um, my question is um, about. You say you would like a treaty change and a reverse of the pro-integration bias of the treaties. Um, let me give you a helping hand um, for, the, for the new treaty. What about reversed enhanced cooperation to uh, draw back competences? Um, but whether or not uh, I agree on that, um, what are the negative, the negative uh, consequences of these treaty changes and especially about the drawback of competences? And let me uh, give you one example about uh, potential reversed enhanced cooperation or reverse co uh, variable geometry, and that is an ever more complex union. Uh, do you have your thoughts on that? Thank you. Um. Well, thank you very much for your question. Uh, first of all, I think treaty change is, is needed uh, because uh, we cannot bring about sufficient structural change with a quick fix um, or a minor revision of the treaty or a minor agreement. It needs the full political weight of the nation states and of government leaders to show that they're able to uh, change when necessary. I think there is a support uh, among several, several government leaders, for example, obviously the British government uh, is in a position of asking for it because Prime Minister Cameron will need to show something um, prior to the general elections of May next year. If he stands there empty-handed saying, oh, nobody wants to talk to me, uh, then that is a, a relatively poor show and will probably lose to uh, the UKIP and Nigel Farage. But other countries, there are similar problems. I think in Germany, there is a general sentiment that Europe should do less and that the German Germany and the German Parliament, particularly the uh, position of the German Parliament in, uh, in the decision-making process, should be strengthened, uh, in particular with regard to the um, European stability mechanism, which, by which every transfer of money from Germany has to be, has to, um, be given the consent of the German Parliament. Um, I think Scandinavian countries are in favour of change, uh, and so is the Dutch government. Also the French government is in favour of this. France always has had a, um, a view on Europe in which the member state is at the heart, or is the Gaullistic view of Europe, which, generally, which is generally a French view. And here, <coughs> and here the, the current government, of course, is provoked by Mrs. Le Pen. So in order to sort of pacify the revolting public opinion, governments will look for a certain degree of change. Now you qualify this as a process of reverse, or I would rather say unraveling. I don't think that is a process of unraveling or trying to break the logic of the, of the treaty. Um, what I try to do is to, to introduce a sense of priority. Um, the European Union is not able to do everything and legislate in all fields in the same way. So it has to set priorities and basically the core competences I refer to is the field of, of, sh of, of pooled sovereignty. Um, and the second secondary competences are competences also important but there is not a need to uh, very far-reaching legislation as is now the case in basically all policy areas. Um, so I think the, 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 the sense of focus and priority is most important. And for example, in the field of the monetary union, there's generally a general felt um, need uh, to go further here and to have a stronger uh, inspection of national budgets and impose budgetary discipline. 
very often at the moment the Commission is very soft on this issue. The Commission is very hard on other issues but soft and too soft on this issue. Uh, the Commission should be more an enforcer of, uh, of, uh, of these policies. And I, I think that by uh, setting priorities um, you can also deepen the cooperation in the field or the areas which I've indicated. For example, the single market. Uh, you may be aware of the fact that Germany still has not transposed the uh, directive, the, uh, the um, services directive. I'm not saying this because Mr. Bolkestein is here at the moment, but, <coughs> but it is still, it's still met by a lot of opposition in Germany, uh, but also, for example, in Italy. So the uh, single market, market concept, which basically is the basis of European cooperation, uh, which can be extended even beyond the European Union, uh, has not met its full dimension. Here we need more Europe. Um, uh, but in other fields like social policy, cultural policy, uh, sports policy, or whatever policy, we can do with less, without harming the main objectives of the EU. Uh, so bringing about this, this trade-off would basically be one of the centerpieces of negotiations uh, on the new treaty. Christina okay. Arato. Thank you very much. First of all, thanks for inviting me uh, to this very interesting event. Uh, and thanks for your uh, very enjoyable and thought-provoking presentation. I would have two comments uh, to you. Uh, one is about uh, a potential inconsistency that I, uh, that I noticed, because you, uh, your main message, as far as I understood, was that uh, nation states are the main um, players of integration. On the other hand, you say that uh, you would keep monetary union and in order to, uh, to make it work. You would, prov uh, you would propose to complete a fiscal union. Now, a fiscal union uh, means uh, a strong commission, uh, means stronger institutions and stronger check <coughs> on uh, member states' budgeting. And probably this, uh, uh, this uh, ability to, to control national budget is such a strong horizontal power over member states than any uh, policy area uh, that is currently uh, within the competence areas of the European Union. Because uh, if you have a soft commission, uh, you would end up uh, like in 2003, because we think that Greece was appallingly uh, overspending uh, in, two th in, uh, in 2006, 2007, <coughs> 2008. But actually the first two countries were Germany and France. And actually the Commission initiated in 2003 uh, an excessive deficit procedure against these countries. And the Council voted that down. So if member states <coughs> remain as strong as, as they are or as strong as you wish them to, do, uh, to be, then uh, monet the monetary union will, be, will not be uh, uh, sustainable. So that's my first comment, uh, and I would like your uh, reaction to yeah. that. Second, national parliaments within the polity uh, of, uh, of Europe, uh, it has been popping up uh, from time to time. And uh, before we include them in the uh, real normal procedure of European decision making, maybe we should have a look how exactly national parliaments deal with European issues. Uh, there are very different models. The, the strongest uh, national parliament is the Danish Folketing, as far as I know uh, at the moment, uh, whose uh, European Affairs Committee actually gives ministers within the council uh, exact or direct uh, uh, orders what to, uh, what to represent in Brussels. Whereas in the majority of <coughs> member states, uh, uh, European affairs uh, committees 
are very weak. They have no capacities, they have no staff to deal with the vast number of issues that, uh, that m potentially uh, come from Brussels. So what do they do? Uh, they seek for help from the government. So what you end up with, when including national governments, if national governments, parliament, uh, uh, European uh, Affairs Committees works as now, is that you are doubling the representation of national parliaments with, uh, with a trick. Thank you. Yeah. Well, let, me, let me first turn to the uh, question of the monetary union. So the monetary union is, a, is an example of pooled sovereignty. So once you decide to join uh, a single currency, you're part of the monetary union, you're part of a system of pooled sovereignty, you're within the core competence of one of the core competences of the European Union, and this requires a um, strong institutions, for example, to enforce the agreements and to set the criteria, and it also requires a stronger European Commission, <coughs> at least stronger than was the case in 2003. Um, where France and, and Germany were um, basically disrespecting the, um, the criteria and uh, regardless of whatever the Commission thought about it. Uh, in particular, and then Commissioner Prodi, who said that the, the treaties were stupid anyway. So this was not a very good start of the enforcer. Uh, this is the area of pool sovereignty. So. The concept of the nation-state is a concept, and I've been saying that the nation-states are the source of legitimacy of European cooperation and, 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 Europe and economic integration, because people can um, rely to them. They can, uh, they, uh, the people, uh, generally public opinion regards their government, their parliament as the institutions to look at whenever there is a problem, and uh, in that sense. Uh, there is no European people, there are the peoples of Europe and there are the member states of the European Union. Now once, once these member states have decided to pool sovereignty in a, common, in a, <coughs> in a monetary union, uh, then they are in that system. Uh, the United Kingdom decided not to join the Euro, so did Denmark. Uh, many other countries, however, are, are candidate member states of the Eurozone. Uh, for example, Poland. <coughs> and for example, Sweden. Sweden had a referendum on the euro, so Sweden is not is now deliberately not fulfilling one of the criteria to enter the eurozone, uh, poss poss possibly on the on the permanent basis, in order not to join the eurozone. But in principle, it should, like Poland and others. Um, so I don't think there is a contradiction between the member states as a source of legitimacy on the one hand. Uh, and, the, and the monetary union are the, uh, on the other. The monetary union requires a fiscal union, it requires a clear philosophy and concept of monetary policy, which there is not, by the way. The views of, on monetary policy in Germany and France are completely different. The view on national budgets in Germany and France are also completely different. That is one of the problems of the underlying problems of the monetary union is that there is no coherence of views and philosophy on how to conduct monetary policy. And this is reflected within the European Central Bank. Uh, so the, the second question is the role of national parliaments. Well, in the current system, the national parliaments have little chance to stop legislation um, which is uh, initiated by the European Commission because the, uh, the uh, time frame is too short. Whenever the national parliaments find out something is going in the Commission, it's going on in the Commission, they are generally too late. And the system is deliberately uh, uh, designed like this. The Commission wants the national parliaments to be too late, so they can simply carry on regardless. Um, I think, therefore, that this system, this mechanism should be reversed, and that the European Commission should seek the consent of national parliaments. Now the question is, your question basically is how to organize this. Either you would have to go to all parliaments and ask for their consent to initiate legislation in secondary uh, competences, 
Or you could, for example, like very often happens in Germany at the moment, consult the relative, the competent committee of that parliament. And Germany, as Germany is much involved in the, uh, in the European stability mechanism, uh, whenever there is a transfer of money from the, from the German government within the framework of uh, a, Euro, a Euro operation, the budget committee of the German parliament has to give its consent. That's how it is organized now. It used to be the national parliament, but then the national parliament all the time had to convene middle in the middle of holidays and, sure, and, and close to Christmas, etc., which was very inconvenient. So the German parliament decided that it was the authority of the, um, of the budget committee, but this is the, the uh, consequence of the ruling of the German constitutional court. The German constitutional court demands the consent of the German parliament. Uh, which is then organized through the budget committee. <clears throat> Some other people um, are, would be in favor of setting up a sort of a European Senate, uh, which consists of representatives of national parliaments. And they would, okay, well, they would convene, for example, in Brussels, uh, and they would, be, uh, they would be asked to deal with uh, a number of, of draft proposals of the European Commission, and would have to give their consent. This is also one of the uh, possible uh, ways uh, to, to go about it, but that would of course mean another institution uh, in Brussels. One could also abolish another uh, institution, for example, the Committee of the Regions, but every, cons uh, every institution of course has its constituency because it invites people, they have a nice time there, they taste wine, <laughs> they have dinners, so the, those representing regions in, uh, in Europe, they very much like the Committee of the Regions. So abolishing a committee is very difficult. Uh, but uh, setting up a, a, an institution is very easy, uh, I have to say. So um, possibly this is a, 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 a way to, to go about it. But what we have to do is to look at how to organize the, a stronger institutional position of national parliaments as guardians of subsidiarity. That's the main task. Adrian Schout. Okay, thank you uh, for these uh, thought-provoking remarks. Uh, I'm actually picking up uh, on the both themes that uh, Christina just uh, raised. Um, first, about the role of the Commission. <coughs> I'm so glad I don't work there uh, myself. Uh, because if, you ha if you're in a situation at the moment that you have to deal with France, uh, and the questions about its economic reforms and it, it, its uh, um, austerity measures, which it apparently has to take, um, this is a this is a, a, a profound political change process, um, and we've seen how this wor works in the uh, EU. Uh, we know the history is 2003, Germany reformed, France didn't. Um, 2011, if I'm correct, um, uh, Trichet wrote a letter to um, uh, Berlusconi that he had to reform. On Friday, Berlusconi agreed, and on Monday, Berlusconi said in Parliament, oh, well, the ECB will do whatever we want so we can ignore uh, the letter. Um, I'm not quite sure whether that is the situation in France at the moment. I, I really, I don't know. Um, uh, my impression is that in France there is uh, uh, a tremendous dilemma that I think there is an elite that really wants to reform. Uh, I get the impression that, that, that many are trying. Uh, and there is, of course, the whole uh, uh, dark breath of uh, Le Pen uh, at the moment. Uh, what can, in such a, commission, a situation, the Commission really do? Uh, if it if it puts too much pressure on the situation, presumably uh, Le Pen is the, uh, is the victor of that uh, process. Or should the Commission let the situation run its course, putting pressure as much as possible, and maybe that is the process what it is now doing, and that may actually be a rather sensible process. I haven't got the answer, but this is the sort of dilemma, and I think it's important to see the dilemma, because otherwise we are uh, pleading for a stronger uh, commission, whereas the commission actually made very uh, uh, well-balanced uh, guesstimates about its situation. I don't know. I'd be very happy to hear your views because it may be uh, that the commission is in, in, in uh, 
is, is in a careful balancing process and it may be doing precisely the right thing, leading to reform, yet not breaking it. So that about the, France and the role, of the, the, the role of the Commission as enforcer, not just simply saying 3% is 3%. About national parliaments, um, <coughs> I think we have to be careful uh, with going on about uh, emphasizing the role of national parliaments, unless we really know what we're talking about. I've been trying to uh, uh, go back, back on the debate on national parliaments, and already in the 1980s, uh, I, I, I could find things on national parliaments have to be uh, 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 reinforced. The Laken uh, Declaration, 2001, r reads very much, uh, almost literally, like the things that are now being said about the national parliament, yet nothing has come of it some examples, Denmark, Germany. Um, w can we actually really hope on national parliaments that they will play an important role? Uh, there are, I've looked at it in the Netherlands. Uh, there are just a few people who actually understand the EU. Uh, you can say, well, parliamentarians need to think ahead. That's not what parliamentarians do. I've actually had a... a Dutch MP telling me is that, well by the time this commission proposal will go through I'm not uh, I'm, I'm sure not in, in in the seat anymore so it's not political to 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 think uh, ahead of the commission agenda so can parliaments actually do it and then uh, 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 the third question is for clarification uh, you you argued for a green card. And then, of course, the question is, well, how many green cards do we need to have to actually block a commission proposals? And then I think, isn't that precisely what QMV is all about? Well, with regard to France, I think the, uh, the only thing the commission should do and can do is to keep pres pressure on France to, um, uh, to reform and to present a budget within the limits as it has been agreed. And I know this is very hard, and France always regards itself as the exception in Europe. So all the other countries have to uh, comply except for France. Uh, I recently I heard the Prime Minister saying, il faut respecter la France. Uh, he's, in other words, he's saying, um, don't mess around with us because we're different. Uh, and we should be, uh, we are a sort of a exceptionalism. There's an exceptionalism of France with regard to the others. So all the others get angry letters from the Commission to, uh, to adhere to the uh, budgetary criteria, whereas France um, um, gives itself a sort of a, a reserves the right to itself uh, to be different. And here again, France will now come up with some budget cuts, but they are uh, main, mainly, con they, they, they consist of sort of a so soft measures. They are uh, uh, inserting uh, things like fighting fraud, and they already count on the effects of that policy, but as you know, it is very hard to, to fight fraud uh, also in France, particularly with the uh, fiscal burden France has at the moment. So I think the Commission should uh, keep the pressure on France. Um, France is a, is a society that is not that dislikes reform. And France wants to live like the French in France and keep it that way. Um, and basically the politicals, you are saying that the French elite is trying to reform. Well, I haven't seen much uh, of it. Um, President Sarkozy started doing this only at the end of his term. He should ha she should have done that at the beginning, in the first year, because then you have still f four years to overcome the consequences of waking up the, fr the French nation to reform. He did it in his last year and he um, was not re-elected. Mr. Hollande promised uh, the French dream, le beurre et l'argent du beurre, what I talked about. So he, um, um, he changed the uh, retirement age, uh, not upwards but downwards from 62 to 60. And um, now he has to make a change. But he has lost all his credibility in the meantime. One person with credibility in the French government was Minister of, in, of, of, uh, of the Interior, Manuel Valls. I, his popularity rate was very high. And he became Prime Minister, now his popularity is very low. Because he has to talk about change and reform. Um, there is Mrs. Le Pen. Well, basically, she is uh, impersonating the Gaullist dream of a French nation irrespective of the world around you. 
uh, the, 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 she's one of the followers of Colbert, as the socialists are, as most French politicians are. Um, she wants, for example, protectionism. She's very protectionist. I've seen her in the European Parliament. Whenever she speaks, she speaks against immigration and in favor of protectionism. Um, so it is very diffi difficult to change, um, to change uh, the French society in that direction. And the only thing uh, the uh, European Commission can do, and also Germany talking directly to, uh, to France, is to keep pressure and to, for the need of reform. Because at the moment we have a European, uh, we have a monetary union with two completely different philosophies of monetary policy. And that is not sustainable in the, in the future because public opinion will go against it. Nice, yeah. You know? I think this is terribly important because you, you also said the Commission has to be a tough enforcer. That, that's what you said a couple of times. Yes. And now you say the Commission needs to be needs to keep the pressure on. Yes. And so I'm still lost. What should the Commission... The Commission is keeping the pressure on as far as I can see. Or well, should see, it now be a tough enforcer? Yeah, the European Commission doesn't have an army, so it cannot march in. Um, it is not Russia. Uh, what it can do is uh, to keep the pressure on France and to repeat all the time the need to reform and be supported by Germany. And that will, to a certain extent, intimidate the political elite in France to move in that direction and start convincing the French population that certain, that certain reforms are necessary. Um, and that is what has to be done. Uh, only, you see, the French at the moment are living in a world and they are facing or they're experiencing a terrible inferiority complex. They wanted to have a common currency so that France would have a grip on German economic policy and France would be equal to Germany. And now precisely the opposite happens. Germany is far ahead, Germany is economically much stronger, France is the sick man of Europe. And this hurts their national feelings. Um, they feel a sort of a second, secondary power in Europe at the moment. The British economy will or has already overtaken uh, France. The, 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 the Dutch exportations exceed the French. So all these things pile on. And I think that the French, uh, the Fre the French political elite is aware of this, but is simply not able uh, to turn the tide. And that's why this pressure is necessary. Now, the national parliaments, you were talking about subsidiarity, etc. Um, you were quite pessimistic on the role national parliaments could play. You see, national parliaments should not play, not, not try to play uh, the role of the European Parliament. Uh, the national parliament does not have much to say on agricultural policy or other core policies in the European Union. What it should do is focus on subsidiarity, be the guardian of subsidiarity. So we do. We only ask the national parliaments to do one thing, not to do everything, and not to redo work of the European Parliament, but to be the guardian of subsidiarity and organize themselves according to that objective. And that's what they should do. Now you've got members of parliament who either want to know what the European Parliament is doing, uh, they want to give views on uh, issues that are the core competences of the European Commission, uh, they are always looking for information, or they should look at what role they can play in, uh, in protecting uh, subsidiarity. Because that is their, that is their most important task. Uh, and that also feeds the uh, legitimacy that they have to assure. But can they do it? Well, you are very negative about it. Uh, but, uh, but I think they, uh, they can, if they want. And the German Parliament is one of the examples. But I think if there are m member states that just joined the European Union, will probably have members of Parliament have no idea how it works and how to organise themselves in that way. Joost van Aker. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Dirk Jan, for your speech. Um, I would like to to uh, highlight some of the points of the British proposals. You mentioned some documents of the uh, Foreign Office and the uh, Fresh Start Group and the Dutch cat Catalog, but pr probably a more provoking uh, document appeared in March in the Sunday Telegraph, a seven-point British seven-point plan. And um, I'm quite curious to, to figure out how, yeah, what, what the, the chances are as you raise them 
to be acceptable to others, and I would like to highlight, um, I think, the, f the three most provoking ones, also recently in the news, uh, talking about the uh, ECHR, um, protect British citizens un unencumbered by unnecessary interference from the European institutions, including the European Court for Human Rights, free movement to take up work, not free benefits, connected to support for the continued enlargement for the EU, to new members, but with new mechanisms in place to prevent face migrations across the continent. I think if we interpret this uh, strictly, um, then it also includes, uh, I think, the disappearance of the non-discrimination principle uh, related to the establishment of EU citizens and their pension benefits, for example, and <coughs> unemployment benefits. And the last point which the British uh, mentioned in their seven-point plan was uh, the end of the ever closer union. You also mentioned that in your speech, the return of competences, so probably the never closer union. And this is a point which, which got interest at the European Council meeting of the, in the 26th of June, where it was part of the conclusions where indeed uh, the other member states we have served Cameron a bit, little bit of comfort by saying, uh, yeah, this, this concept allows that there will be different speeds uh, and a more kind of Europe a la carte. So what is your vision on this, um, this, this, yeah, parts, this the far-reaching seven point plans uh, of, the, of the British? And probably also Mr. Campbell would like to, to, to address Alan Campbell. Uh, <laughs> yes, can I just um, put in for a clarification that of course uh, the Prime Minister wrote that article with two hats on a little bit, so some of it is him as Prime Minister, but there are other elements probably around things like European Court of Human Rights, which are more conservative party policy than necessarily the coalition <coughs> government's policy. Um, yes, with regard to the uh, European uh, Court of Human Rights, um, you see there is a bit of a... Um, uh, well, there's too much supply of legal advice in the framework of European cooperation. The treaty contains many issues of human rights already, the Treaty of Lisbon. Um, many, uh, I mean, and the most, most overarching principle is the principle of non-discrimination. Uh, that is the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg. Now, there is also the European Court of uh, Human Rights in Strasbourg, which basically is doing the same thing, although it has a delay of about 100,000 cases at the moment. So lots of people go there uh, to try to get a solution of their personal case. Uh, but this, this European Court of, of European, uh, this European Court of Human Rights, in my view, it tends to go too far, <coughs> and is in many cases operating autonomously. For example, by awarding voting rights to prisoners in general, which is detested in the UK. So I'm just wondering why the uh, European Court of Human Rights is going that way. Um, it, in my view, um, it operates in a political void and is just pushing for more and more rights uh, and is pushing a rights culture uh, to a very far extent, which is in some countries not acceptable. Um, there is, a, 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 there is a, 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 in Belgium I've learned a very nice expression, la guerre des juges. So the, the war of, 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 uh, of judges. Uh, and that's what we see with the oversupply of legal institutions in the, within the framework of the European Union because the European Court of Human Rights has become part of the acquis communautaire. So it's part of the legislative body of the entire body of the European Union. And I have always thought, that the British may have a point here, that it is, it is slightly too much. We already have the court, the European Court of Justice in, in Luxembourg that was serving as well. And now we add a new layer actually to it, which belongs to another organization, which is the Council of Europe in Strasbourg. And we all have added it, it, it up. Um, and this leads to these sorts of, uh, of rulings. Now, with regard to the ever closer union, I think you are right, that if we would admit that this principle has to be deleted, would open the way for a more, uh, for a, uh, a different, uh, or for a repetition of competences, and for introducing uh, uh, the concept of a catalogue of competences, because the ever closer union, as you admit, uh, is not 
an attainable goal anymore. And by recognizing this, I think it's the first step to be taken. Jiski Hollander. Yes. Well, thanks for your contribution. I al also enjoyed it very much. Um, and I am actually very glad with how this debate here in this room is unfolding right now, because we moved from talking about subsidiarity in, in regard as a, well, a, a fixed list of things that Europe should or should not uh, deal with to the institutional structure that is needed to, well, to come up with what Europe should or should not do, deal with in the end. And I think I share, for a large part, the, ana the analysis that you made in your contribution. Um, but there are, I think, there are some things, of course, that, that puzzled me. So I want to make sure that I understand them correctly. With regard to what you say, the source of legitimacy of the European Union, you stress that the well, the only source in your regard is the, uh, the of the primary source is or are the member states. But it puzzled me then when you uh, when we entered into to, uh, the the example of France and you stated, well, we need a tough commission there because well, some somehow the French government and French parliamentarians have got lost on their way, they're, 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 they were lost in, in feelings of, uh, well, the inferiority, and we need the commission to take them back on the, on the path of, of truth, <laughs> uh, to put it quite edgy. I don't understand how you can see that the only source of legitimization of uh, the European Union are the member states, and then eventually come up with, with such a statement which runs counter to that. And um, uh, you also said in, in relation to the uh, question of uh, Christina next to me, um, when we talked about uh, uh, this, well, well, no, let's leave it for, for the sovereignty uh, uh, as of the legitima legitimation aspect, let's leave it at that. Then the second thing that I wondered was, uh, it, it, it comes, uh, it came across as if you see uh, subsidiarity and a deci decision of subsidiarity as something that is fixed in time and decided uh, one, mo one moment and then, well, everyone agrees. And in your solution, you, I completely agree that national parliament, that the national parliament or national parliamentary parliamentarians sh should involve more in the subsidiarity discussion in Europe, and that's an essential element in, in uh, uh, well, getting the European Union working more democratically. But I don't understand how that can work if we keep looking at national parliaments at one side of the line and the European Union at the other side of the line. You moved in a better direction, I think, when you said that maybe it's also possible to, to involve national parliamentarians maybe into some sort of, well, what I would call a second chamber within the European Union. Because when you came, to, when we discussed the example of the monetary union and you say, well, well yes, that, that's an example of pooling sovereignty. And if you decide to pool sovereignty, then you need to deal with the consequences. But even then, after that moment, there are still moments in time, of course, that, that, that and that's when, when my point comes across, I think that I, in essence, believe that citizens are also the source of legitimization of Europe, because citizens always, in every point in time, have national loyalties and interested interests, just like European interests. And I think that the, the thing with subsidiarity is that we get both citizens in both roles involved throughout the process of European unification. Well, and. Uh, forever and ever. It needs to be an ongoing dialogue which cannot be dealt with within a European Parliament in one state and the, well, then afterwards it's all good and well and settled to, to move further in a uh, European Union. It needs to be an ongoing discussion and we need to find a structure for that, I think, and I hope you want to respond to these things. So, talking about, talking about France again, it's our favorite country. Um, you see, the concept of pooled sovereignty and a monetary union uh, itself is, is a logical one. 
The problem of France is that it entered the Monetary Union with a completely different idea. It's thought to be equal to Germany, first of all, and it thought that in case of uh, problems, the European Central Bank would come to print uh, money and to, to buy a state, a French state bonds, or it would account on Germany to give some extra help. Um, so that is the view uh, on which uh, France and the French base the entry into the monetary union. Uh, now they open up to reality and they see it is different. So it is a, to them all of a sudden, a different um, union than th what they vouch for. Uh, that is the problem with France. And uh, there was a very nice cartoon recently um, in one of the French newspapers uh, which I'm going to use in my new book on the European uh, Parliament, in which Mr. Hollande and, and Mrs. Uh, Merkel were having dinner in Paris, um, and then the waiter came with the bill, and Mr. Hollande said, uh, l'addition est pour madame. So Mrs. Merkel would have to pay the bill. That more or less reflects very well uh, the French attitude on the monetary uh, union. So. There is a problem, and I mean, I'm not trying to talk around uh, the, the, the structural problem of the Euro system, which is a very serious one, and which does not assure the sustainability of the, of the Euro system. Wherever you look in the, in, in the media, whether it's The Economist or whether it's The Financial Times, uh, or look at many uh, economists in Germany, uh, nobody really knows how the story of the Euro system is going to end because there are many underlying differences that we try to keep there uh, but they will emerge one after the other. <coughs> and one of them is the problem of France. Another can be the problem of Italy that says, you know, we have to spend more money. We have to, um, they already have a state, a state debt of 135% of GDP. If spending uh, a lot of money by the state will assure economic growth, they should have a lot, a lot of economic growth. But the, fr the Italian economy has not grown since the introduction of the euro. Uh, and the French uh, economy is in the same situation. And it's very likely that the eurozone, for years to come, is going to be an economic zone of low growth and high unemployment, as Mr. Draghi has, has uh, prognosed. So I think that we are uh, we are not out of the woods with the Euro system. Uh, in spite of the philosophy and in spite of the idea of the ever closer union, that was the basis of it. Um, so I hope I, I answered your question. It is not, I mean, it is not at odds with the, with the concept of uh, member states being the, uh, the source of legitimacy of European uh, cooperation. But once you make a construction that does not work, and is built on illusions, then it will falter and, uh, one day. Uh, and that may well happen, and what will happen to the Euro system, what is most likely, that you are facing revolting public opinions. In a country like France, Mrs. Le Pen may well win the vote on the right side, and on the left it will be Mrs. Aubry, who is one of the, the only positive thing of her, I can say that she's the daughter of Jacques Delors, but for the rest she's a far leftist politician. Uh, and you get these polarizing people as candidates for the French presidency, uh, you mean not only France is in trouble, but the entire Euro system is in trouble. But will it be sustainable? And these elections are only in a few years' time. So um, we, uh, uh, we should have no illusions on this. I, I think it's going to be a very dangerous, dangerous couple of years where you may see the UK leaving the European Union, where you will see France in a sort of a strong national domestic political conflict, the Germans not knowing what to do, uh, and the Italians spending more money. I think that is the recipe for disaster altogether, but I'm optimistic. I haven't come from New York to say all these things and then go back and have a nice time there. Well, democracy is a dangerous business. <laughs> in the then your idea of the second chamber, in, uh, second chamber in, in Brussels, yeah, if people would agree with that, I think it's a good idea, be, because it would give national parliaments a face in Brussels. Uh, and it would uh, institutionalize uh, their guardianship of subsidiarity. There is one institution that will not like it, it is the European Parliament. 
they will scream. They will scream whenever they hear this idea. I mean, Mr. Verhofstadt will go out of his mind if he hears this, because he will regard such a second chamber as a gathering of traitors, of people that want to take away powers from the um, post-national uh, federal Europe. But personally, I think that if we want to organize uh, a strong position of national parliaments in, uh, as guardians of subsidiarity, we should also give it a face. We should also people to go there and people to negotiate. Uh, and then the Commission would have to come up and present itself and present its draft legislation. And that chamber could say, well, we don't like this, we don't like that. Uh, and be, so uh, you're not getting our consent uh, as far as these proposals are concerned. So that is, a, that is a good idea. Some people call it a second chamber, other people call it a senate or whatever, but uh, that would give it a face. There are three participants who raised their hand to make a further remark, and then we are going to have the lunch break. The first of them is Wouter Hulstein. Excuse me. Not do sports policy, social policy, but focus. For instance, you mentioned the uh, single market, the common market. But did it, did it not all start with that? that it you should have a single common market, and from then on it, it grew. Because everything can be, if taken from one point of view, be part of a single market, or put it differently, be a, um, uh, uh, to obscure the, single, the process of evolving the single market. So the, the decision will be still the same, where does the single market stop, or where can you say that this is not too much of an obstruction of the single market? I mean, the uh, tobacco policy was, was an issue you know, that, uh, a few years before. Uh, you could say the same about social policy. I mean, if different countries have different social policies, it does mean that you know, the, uh, the single market is... There's a relation to the single market because it means that businesses have different capabilities of uh, competing with each other because they have different mm -hmm. uh, social policies to take into account. So everything is related to the common, to the single market. Um, and next um, to that, the uh, competence uh, catalog. There's always been a kind of competence catalog in the treaties from the very earliest start. But as long as people who are, have the, uh, the authority to interpret that catalog, uh, interpret not like literally, but with the goals where, they get, where these uh, treaties or where the single market should lead to, then what would change if you write it down in different words? Yeah, well, you see, the, the, the single market is a very broad concept by itself, and uh, together with the common agricultural policy, um, it was the start of, uh, of economic cooperation and integration based on the four freedoms. So basically, they define the single market, the free movement of workers, capital, services, and goods. And the free movement with goods we have extended to Turkey. One day, we could also extend the free movement of goods to Ukraine, for example. It is a concept that can be uh, enlarged, basically, to several areas that are not part or member of the European Union as such. Other, move, uh, other freedoms are much harder to uh, enlarge, for example, the free movement of workers. Um, I, don't, I don't think we can ever apply it to Turkey. Uh, and um, at the moment, in the discussion in the UK, you see that uh, the Prime Minister there wants to uh, limit the free movement of workers within uh, the EU. Um, so the single market is something that always has to be, is always a, an, an issue of, um, of, of uh, economic and, and, and political efforts. Because companies will have the inclination to um, discard the level playing field, to make deals, to build up cartels, you also need a strong competition policy, and the competition commissioner has the authority to be the real enforcer uh, of that policy. Um, you see, the whole idea of, of, of blending it with social policy came at the, the end of the 1980s, where the Labour Party in Britain was anti-EU. It's hard to imagine these days. Um, and Jacques Delors was able to, uh, to charm them by uh, designing a social Europe and a social model so that the Labour Party would be enthusiastic about the EU. And it's basically what happened <coughs> with social policy 
um, and the social protocols that came up later. Um, so the, the story of the you know, of the socialist was we need okay we go we go along with the single market but we also need social legislation. Now the the, the, the working hours directive came up ninety three. Uh, now socialists are talking about a European wide minimum wage, uh, which will be very hard to uh, implement, and uh, which would also cause huge dis uh, unemployment in countries like Bulgaria, Romania. Uh, and other countries that, that have a competitive advantage at the moment, which they will lose once they will introduce an EU-wide minimum wage. So EU-wide minimum wage uh, adds up, promotes the level playing field? No, no, uh, no, no not, not a level playing field. I mean, the concept of the single market doesn't mean that you have uh, a similar, similar wages uh, in Europe. Um, the countries are free to um, to, to uh, design their own social policies and uh, wages are basically is a result of negotiations in those uh, member states. But if you would force one set and one system or one mechanism to create an EU-wide minimum wage for all member states, the minimum wage in Bulgaria would be much higher than it is at the moment. And the result of that would be a lot of, em of employment. It would make lots of people unemployed. So um, I think that um, while well, we've talked about the services directive not being implemented in many countries, uh, there are all sorts of things where the, uh, the full dimension of the single market has not been used. Now your other question was about the, the catalogue. Uh, it is there, but it is interpreted in a different way. Yeah, well, that is, uh, that is very common in the, in the EU. Uh, it is not a matter of rules, but a matter of interpretation of rules. And, um, and in that way, the legal service in the European Commission is so it's like the Vatican. It uh, inter interprets, uh, the interpretation of the legal service will always be widening the scope and the powers of the European Commission. Uh, and so it will say, uh, there is a legal base, uh, and we have to act, and there is the political imperative to act, what I talked about, the thing I just talked about. Uh, so I, I, in order to make a clear separation and to, um, to put an end to this uh, endless process of interpretation, I think we have to redesign the treaty in that way. Peter Kleppe. Um, just a small remark regarding what uh, Jiske uh, said. Um, I think uh, many people, especially also in Germany, uh, they would typically support subsidiarity and the right of member states. And uh, in the broader scheme of things, uh, Germany as a country is probably of all the big countries in the world the least imperialist, uh, the least uh, keen on intervening in uh, other people's affairs. There was a huge debate in the parliament when the Afghanistan mission was decided, uh, for example. But then um, I think the, the, um, th this goes together, this, this feeling of really not wanting to intervene into other countries with um, um, when you have a system of, of transfers that you're, you feel um, that there is a need to also uh, check what happens with the transfer. So Germans uh, who would be very keen to respect subsidiarity would typically then support a tough commission action on countries like France and Italy because they have sort of been enjoying uh, the benefits of the, uh, of the transfers which have been happening within the, within the Euro um, framework. Uh, Germany doesn't want to bail out the Spanish banking system, but, but they had to agree that. They had to allow the ECB to lose its collateral standards to bail out all these banks. So then Germany says, look, if we're doing that, then we have to intervene. We need to have this banking union, uh, all kinds of uh, constraints on, on banks and uh, impose how uh, banks are being uh, restructured. So j just to explain that, I think in their mind, this goes perfectly uh, together. On the one hand, respect um, the rights of, of member states when they do not take uh, subsidies, when they do not accept transfers, but when they um, take the step of accepting transfers, they um, also accept uh, intervention. My question would be then, what is your question? Because I think she made a good point of okay. uh, wh why are you in favor of commission action when you're actually very wary of it on other fields. And I think you, you take a very German approach uh, to this. Um, and I think um, it, it's basically uh, about a condition of, of uh, you know, w 
only allowing commission action when actually transfers happen, yeah, not in other okay. fields. Sebastian Pickel. Hello. Um, yes, no, to introduce myself first, because this is my first time I'm speaking. Sebastian Pickel from Institute Noam from Slovenia. Um, I don't know if I will have, or we all will have the time to um, go deeper into what I'm now actually going to say, but actually your, let's say, state of the art the description of current situation in the beginning of your speech um, mentioned huge problems on the level of, uh, let's say, job policies, of unemployment around the whole European Union. Mm, you focused mostly um, uh, on the south and so on, which is true. But anyhow, um, as you said, um, reality always um, takes revenge when ignored. Um, this is probably going to be a um, problem further on as well uh, inside European Union. And um, how would you address this issue? Thank you. Um, yes, I <coughs> I didn't want to be pessimistic on <coughs> on the describing uh, the future of the European Union, um, but on the other hand, we have to look at the political impact of high unemployment in several member states. Now, the unemployment rate in Spain and youth unemployment is about fifty percent, and the same in in Italy, uh, in Greece, uh, Portugal to a certain extent. Uh, and that will have certain consequences. Uh, what we see is um, voters uh, protesting at the moment at the ballot box. Um, so uh, Italy had its, uh, its uh, five-star movement that came up. It may change for anything different at the next election. Greece has its uh, Syriza, a far-left party, which is more or less the biggest party of Greece. Uh, Spain has its Podemos which is a new leftist party, but bigger than the PSOE and the Socialist Party at the moment. Uh, France has her, has her, I would rather say, uh, uh, Mrs. Le Pen. And so people are unhappy about what's going on. And particularly the youth uh, is losing its prospects of a future. Now, how can you solve that? Well, there's no quick fix here either. You cannot solve that overnight. But the problem of all these countries that they have lost competitiveness. And the word competition these days in Brussels has become a dirty word, uh, oddly enough. Competition, by the, by the way, is a concept that um, produces a sound economy, stronger companies, export uh, possibilities, um, and that is a part of a sound economic policy. It is disliked in Brussels, it is disliked in France, Italy, and all the other countries in Spain. Uh, for example, Spain has an over-regulated labor market. You're either in or out. Once you're in, you stay in, and your labor costs are very high. Once you're out, it's very hard to get in. Young people don't get in. Same problem. The same problem accounts for Italy and, and the other countries. So what these countries really need, and what they should have already have done years ago, is reform of the social systems. Um, and they haven't been doing that because there was no political support for it. And the countries have thought we can get out of this nasty situation by the European Union coming to help us, first of all, save our banks, as happened in, in Spain, where basically six banks, regional banks that were bankrupt, were turned into one big bank called Bankia, which was too big to fail and which had to be saved by the European Union and by the uh, European taxpayers. Uh, so um, the other thing is uh, they also expect uh, um, a loose money policy of the European Central Bank. There was a lot of resistance from the, Ger from the German Bundesbank against that policy, but what we see now is that Draghi is able to impose that policy more and more. Whether it's going to help, I'm not sure, because uh, cheap money po policies uh, do not create new jobs or not create employment or economic growth. Um, so I think this unemployment problem is going to last for, uh, for, for quite a few years and will have, an, have, a, have a, um, a political impact uh, in the future and there is no simple solution of these countries. The only way to get through is, is either, uh, is, is basically to, within the euro system, is to um, 
uh, to go through the process of domestic uh, devaluation, uh, so interior, in, internal de de devaluation, and reform the labor markets and regain competitiveness. It's the only way to go about it. But that will still take a couple of years. I almost feel like a commissioner towards France, but as Alan Campbell is now Frenchman, but as Scott, I give him the opportunity to make one last short remark. Merci. Um, I, I, sorry, I just wanted to, to pick up on something that Voucher had said earlier about um, the single market and uh, perhaps misuse or abuse of the single market as a rationale for uh, action. And it's just to say that uh, in our balance of competence review, that was one of the points which came out of the consultation was that a lot of stakeholders felt that this is an issue that would need to be addressed. They realised, of course, the importance of the single market, you know, that actually there's so many things which are great in terms of creating the level playing field, but we have to be cautious and make sure that we don't just create automatic harmonisation, which actually is the wrong thing to do and affects competition in general. Um, and perhaps that means that the whole overall balance of competition reviews aren't quite so Sir Humphrey-esque, but might be useful in some <laughs> way. Okay, thank you.